P Time A has had a sustainable design philosophy ever since he made his first ever waste piece as a student at Design Academy in Eindhoven in the late 1980s. His first piece was a cupboard made entirely from salvaged floorboards and old planks. Now he wants uniqueness to be part of everyone's daily life. Together with IKEA, he has created Industriel, a mass-produced collection that celebrates imperfection. The collection will premiere in 2018. So. Welcome to Madrid. Thank you. I guess you'll have a chance to walk a little around. What do you think about uh, the exhibition? Well, uh, I like the building very much. It's like the common home. So, <laughs> so a good choice to, to, have, to select this old industrial building. I love that stuff. Yeah. And it, it's, it gives a, a perfect platform for the designs. So it's really nice. Good. What do you mean by coming home? I have an old building. I always worked from the beginning until now in old industrial buildings. So my collection and everything I do is actually created in an environment like this. So it's, it's for me coming home and for the collection sort of also. Good. I think it's a little bit like coming home for IKEA as well. Working on simplicity, being down to earth. What do you think, Marcus? I think actually, if you come to, a, to the office of Pete, it's not like an office, it's, a, it's like going into a factory. And it is actually a factory, and that, that's one of the things that I like about your way of working. You're really down to production and starting off from that, that in the beginning. And I think that that's, that's the very starting point for this collection also. Yeah, sure. How did the collaboration start? Was it you contacting IKEA or IKEA contacting you? And that's a, 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 I get a lot of phone calls, which is a little bit related to this question, to people from Holland, and they say, uh, uh, I have a good idea, or I would like to collaborate, collaborate with IKEA, and then I say, I really don't know. I think they don't know themselves either. You just have to meet somebody. So I met uh, Karen uh, a few times on the fair, and uh, on the salon in Milan, and we liked each other, and in the end we thought, well, we have to work together, and we just started. So there's no official way and there's no story. It's just that you have contact with somebody like like all, you know, like everybody has his own. Isn't that isn't that the best start of the collaboration that you actually like each other? I, I never started different. So for me it's the normal way, but I don't know an official way. So so I don't have an answer to, to uh, how to start collaborating with IKEA. I uh, just try to meet uh, Karen or or Marcus or somebody else. This is not the first time you're working with IKEA. Uh, what made you do it again? Well, when we started, we started because we wanted to work together just to experience it. And we also knew at that moment we made the Yasa collection. So I was part of the design team and made some items for it. But we knew at that moment already that we would like to make a, a full collection without any limits to, to, uh, to like materials or, or divisions. Um, so we needed an ID, and then uh, I, I discussed with Karen the idea of handmade silver produced, and this we actually discussed together, and then we thought, well, let's do it. This, this, this was a good start, and also a solution for a, a problem and an ID, which Marcus and Karen already had for a long time. So uh, the, the, the thing to make things by hand and then reproduce the mass, that was that very simple, yeah. actually. What do you believe is Ikea's role in this? We often get questions about why do we collaborate with others? What is Ikea's role in this process? Yeah, but for, for us, it's always the same thing. You know, First of all, it's about curiosity. We're curious about learning stuff. So for us, the collaboration is never about, you know, oh, here is the great star, the time ape or something like that. He's, he's a great person, but it's about what we could learn from each other. And we saw that, you know, the, the, you're thinking about production and you're thinking about the handicraft and you're also extremely resourceful with all of your your uh, your material you work in a different way with materials i think and has done that for such a long time and that is something that we wanted to learn from and also i think uh, i still remember those first discussions about mass production but in a new way we, we talk back and forth about how could we do this in something that might not resemble the typical mass produced items and, but because it's a little bit a, a contrast, what what we are doing, what you are doing, is is like two opposites, but on one hand, 
but they're quite alike also because you're close in production. And the, the thing which uh, I realized later on, but everybody thinks it's extremely different what we do compared to what uh, IKEA has. But there's one big similarity, is that we both focus on the, on the whole process, from the ID until the consumer. We do actually the same. We sell our products to people who come to us and directly buy our dealers, but we have a very, you know, we, we're in charge of everything. And IKEA does the same. So normally, you, you talk to somebody who is just a part in this complete chain, so it's either the distributor, or it's the designer, or it's the manufacturer, or it's the brand, but we're all in one, and uh, IKEA is the same. So we, we were, uh, it was quite easy to communicate about all kinds of aspects which are need, needed to make a good product. So if it's not uh, like uh, lockdown, and you have to ship it all over the world, it doesn't make sense. So lockdown is one of the obvious differences between IKEA and what we do. But I knew that, and I understand that if somebody says, yeah, this is not compact enough, I say, I, I'm not starting a, a discussion about that. I discuss about a lot of things, but not about uh, realistic things or practical things. So the pr pragmatic approach all the way from the ID until it's actually in the, in the stores is something which we have in common and which makes the whole process much easier than like a designer who has to fight for his IDs through this process. Yes, yeah, so it's we're like a common process. Yeah, we are, we are both process minded and not only like it should be a picture like this and uh, let's see how to, to achieve that. It's, mm. it's, we changed everything all the time also, which is fun. I can imagine. <laughs> what can you tell us about the collection? The uh, very content of the collection, yeah, I think it's grown it, as always. We always start off with, you know, we want to like not so many things, but then you get more and more ideas, so it's grown over the way. And now it's, it's furniture pieces, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's glassware, it's tableware, it's even textiles inside of it. And, but it all has this common idea of, of making things unique through the manufacturing process. And I think the best way to, to talk about it is actually to show it off and to, to see the stuff there. Yeah. Oh, we killed a lot of garlics also during the process. So, so uh, <laughs> making lamps makes also, makes also that you have to throw a lot of them and yeah. create new ones. We only have like two items which were from the original series of drawings. But what I like in the end is that almost everything, even the, the more like industrial um, um, inspired products. So <laughs> one of the commissions was make something from pine wood because nobody likes a smooth pine anymore. So we need a different approach, a different character, and in the end it, become, it became handmade, which was not originally the idea. And we added products like the glass, which is made in France, like the wheel with the machine, bam, bam, very fast. And Karen at a certain moment said, maybe we have to skip this, and no, we're not going to skip it, because this is a million, you know, it's like, like very fast, and each time it stamps a really lousy glass, which is not round, so they have to switch off the quality check, because it checks if it's round. But ours are not round, so they have to. to uh, it goes to uh, to a machine which which is uh, uh, tempers the temperature so slowly, and then it goes to a check where they have like a computer looking at the lasers are round. They have to no no this this we don't need because it has it has to be like a very strange shape. So we, we actually use this handmade ID for really big parts, big quantity pro production processes, which we didn't know when we started. But in the end, is the contrast I between mass yeah. production and uh, <laughs> actually we copy lousy designs, very bad designs, you know, bad drawings and so on. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to try from out of this thinking also was to actually, you know, great design is very much about creating a, an emotional bond between man and object. So how you could do that. And, and one of the things there is to, to force people to, to more or less make a choice. Do I love this piece a little bit more than that piece? If you buy something at IKEA, most often it's like a palette of the very same thing. So here's a thousand of bases and they look exactly the same. Then it's harder to make that emotional bond. But if you have a palette with bases that all are a little bit different, then you force people to make a choice. I love this a little bit more than that one, because this is the difference that I like. Then you have a tendency to stick to it longer also. So it's a more sustainable behavior from shopping behavior, which is also interesting. 
it connects. We had a very nice uh, discussion about those faces because that was one of the first ideas to make like uh, a series of faces and then copy them, which is as expensive as one in the same mm -hmm. face. And they're all sort of a mold, like handmade. And then we were quite far in the process of already producing and we're talking about how to put them on the pellet, like five different ones on the pellet. And then somebody said, but people start picking on the floor in the stores. It, be it becomes chaos and then everybody started panicking. And then at a certain moment, then I said, this is what we wanted. <laughs> yes, that's what we wanted. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so now it will be five different phases, or, uh, I don't know again, exactly, uh, on a pellet with one number. So it's not five numbers. So you actually buy different phases under one number, which is unique for IKEA. And so unique, unique, unique. It's a sort of, yeah, it's double unique in that sense. Yeah. How many products in total, uh, finally, in the, in the collection? Millions. Millions. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer because I don't know it. A lot. <laughs> no, it's not that much. 22, I think. Yeah. 22 at the end of the day, is it? 22? I think. So the numbers for the collection. Numbers is interesting yeah. if, if we do open source it. So if you talk at IKEA to a person, I learned so it's something from the designer's perspective. If you talk to somebody who doesn't offer numbers, you don't talk. Because you need uh, because uh, at IKEA they have 10,000 numbers, and to make something new they have to drop something out. And you, if you want to design something, you need somebody who is actually owning processing a owning a number. So the first thing you ask if you talk to some talk to somebody at IKEA is, do you have numbers? Yes, okay, then we're going to have dinner or something. Because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Well, it sounds like we're an accountant uh, company rather yeah. than a no, it's, a, it's, it's simple because if you make more numbers, the stores has to be bigger, the, the, the infrastructure, yeah. the logistics, so it's, it's a, a very normal idea. But if you think about it, it, it's a very important issue at IKEA is that you always have 10,000 numbers. So the classics is a part and the rest you can change. I thought it was quite interesting. I have a lot of stories about numbers. <laughs> Very good. It's, amazing. it's good to hear yeah. that you learned something too. Yeah, I learned a lot. <laughs> it's amazing listening to you, and I think that makes a great deal of difference um, being IKEA and together with you in a part of the whole process to see how you actually develop the products. Very good. I, uh, you will have a chance to talk more with.